Uh, hi, I'm Sarah Goldman. This is Paul Tarshin. Uh, we both work at Facebook. Uh, we're working on a project called HHVM, which you may or may not have heard of. It's PHP related. So if you think PHP is a clowny language, stick around, actually. It's, <laughs> we're going to try and make it less clowny. Uh, so uh, we're talking about Hack. We're also talking about HHVM. HHVM is the runtime that powers Hack and powers actually all of Facebook and a few other sites around the internet. But what is it exactly? Well, HHVM is a drop-in replacement for PHP. So if you've got a website right now that's running PHP, you could potentially take that code, drop HHVM right in place. It'll run across the same FPM, FCGI channel that PHP is running on, and it'll serve up all your pages. We hope. Um, this is a complete re-implementation of PHP, so we may have gotten a couple of the specific implementations wrong, but uh, ideally, PHP plus APC or opcache, if you're using a new version of PHP, PHP disappear, get replaced by HHVM. Processes the pages the same way, gives you the results the same way. You should have an identical thing before and after. It'll just run a lot faster. Because that is one of HHVM's primary uh, goals, is to run a lot faster. Uh, it runs anywhere, as long as you define anywhere, as 64-bit Linux systems. Um, <laughs> We do run on Mac OS in interpreted mode, and we're just about to, ready to run on Windows in interpreted mode, uh, but uh, this, that's an uphill climb. Those are some really different platforms, particularly Windows. So how close is HGVM to PHP? We're actually really close. We've been tracking against head, um, so we've got all the 5.6 features. If you're running PHP 5.6 already, we've got all those features in. Variatic, splats, uh, older stuff like generators. I call it generators old. Um, namespaces, and we've got all this stuff that we do uniquely in HHVM, stuff that PHP doesn't support. Uh, I wish PHP would support it. I think it'd be great if we had a single language, but um, we're working on that. Um, I personally, sorry, uh, also work on the PHP project, so I try to bring some of these ideas back and maybe talk about them and uh, see what makes sense for PHP as a whole. Uh, Paul's going to give you a, a more in-depth look at those later on. So does that mean that HHVM can run all your code? Not necessarily. Um, so if you look at unit tests, we, we run about 60% of PHP's unit tests, which is not bad. You know, It means the thing mostly works the way PHP is supposed to work. But 40% is a pretty big gap, right? That's a lot. Well, it turns out that 40% is the stuff that most people don't care about. We have the top frameworks that uh, people are actually using, things like Symfony, uh, Cake, Drupal, things like that. They're running just fine on HHVM because the features that people actually use, that's the stuff that we've prioritized and implemented. So don't sweat the small stuff too much. The past tests we're not passing are things like, oh, this error message has a verb in a different position or something like that. Do you care about that as a developer? Not as much, probably. So. How do you get it running? It's actually just as easy to install as PHP if you're on Ubuntu or some kind of Debian type operating system. Um, we do have pre-built packages and we're trying to get them into the official distributions. Uh, Debian, I believe, is going to pick us up really soon, like any day now. Um, and sort of all the rest of the distributions we hope are going to sort of domino out of that. People tend to treat Debian as like the first step for any new package. Uh, but you can go to our repository, do an app get install, you've got HHVM running. Yes, Patrick? We have debug builds. Yes, we do. We do, apparently. Um, we also have dev packages. So if you want to build your own extensions off of us, you can install those dev packages as well. We just introduced those like last week. Yep. Um, things are moving fast, and we're trying not to break things. Um, if you're on some other distro that we don't support properly, like I think we have a lot of problems with Arch. Um, uh, Gen 2, obviously, is its own special beast. Um, you can compile it. That may take a little bit of time or a lot of time, depending on your system. I can get a build in half an hour. Uh, Zev Sarasky said he tried to build us, and it took him hours and hours and hours. Um, I, I don't doubt that. I'm not putting in quotes for that. But uh, it hopefully will not take you that long if you're not building it on a one-core laptop. Um, and it's all standard tools. Uh, CMake rather than auto tools. But apart from that, it should be just like building P regular PHP. How do you get it running? Well, again, just like running PHP. Configure your server, say, here's my CGI endpoint. Start up HHVM as your CGI service. Done. Walk away. Um, obviously, you want to configure it, put all the files in the right place, turn on magic quotes, because everybody uses magic quotes, right? We don't even everybody uses magic quotes, right? That's a good answer. Um, so that's sort of like a quick 
history of, of what HGVM is. Paul's now going to give you a sort of a look at what our open source project process looks like and why it sometimes sucks. <laughs> what an intro. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Paul. Uh, let's chat about what open source looks like, because this is OSCON, right? It might be a nice, important thing. Okay, so 2010, we launched uh, HHV, or no, uh, HPHPC. Everyone remember this? Hands up if you remember HPHPC. This is this crazy cross-compiler. It takes PHP and converts it to C++, and then compiles that with GCC. This is mildly insane, and uh, I highly recommend you don't use it. Um, but back in 2010, that's what we actually ran Facebook.com on. It was a quick and dirty hack and worked pretty well. Um, so we threw it over the wall. Uh, the build system was just a disaster. Uh, you had to hold your mouth the right way in order to get the thing to compile um, and didn't get too much adoption. Who would have thought, right? Um, and then in October, uh, we decided that, you know, even open sourcing the code is too much work and we'll probably just stop doing that. That would be a, a good thing for the project, right? Well, come July, Sarah joins the team, yay, and decided, well, open source actually matters. We should probably start doing that thing again. Um, and did a big code push into GitHub. Uh, we had a fairly, you know, manual push process. Um, but, you know, it, it was working. People could start using it. We had a, a couple of projects start taking us on and trying us out. Um, Wikimedia took a look at us and uh, turned the other way and ran away because um, HPHPC was insane. So, uh, but, you know, we, we uh, had an open source presence. But 2013, along comes HHVM. This was the replacement that we had been working on for three years once HPHPC came out. Um, you know, even we decided that this thing was insane and should probably write something a little better um, and wrote an actual virtual machine. You know, it takes the bytecode and actually compiles it. Sarah will deep dive into what it does. But we launched this in 2013. And this completely replaced everything in the repository. Um, we deleted all the crazy old cross-compiler stuff. Uh, you can still find it under a tag in the repo somewhere for posterity. But... Uh, uh, what you're running right now is going to be the correct virtual machine. Um, when that happened, we declared bug bankruptcy, closed all the old awful bugs, that most of them were spam, um, and started fresh. Uh, and since then, we have merged, what, 750 pull requests uh, from open source contributors. It's been a great, like, that's like two a day since we joined. Um, since we started this HHVM stuff. So that's been pretty good. We closed over 2,000 bugs. This is Sarah and my full-time job, is going through and making sure that this works for the community and not just for Facebook. So it's been pretty good. The community, you can kind of notice the uptick uh, in contributions. Not all of those are us. Um, actually, um, <laughs> thankfully, not most of those are us. The community is starting to take over, which is kind of exciting. And then what have we done in 2014? Um, well, we have a bunch of stuff. We have uh, continuous integration. Yay! So you can come and check on hhvm.com slash frameworks and see you know, how the framework test runs are running on each version on every commit. So you can keep an eye on that. Uh, we have mirroring of the, of the GitHub repo back and forth. Docs. We launched a docs site. Anyone read docs.hhvm.com? Hey, yay, thank you. Um, tell me after whether it was good or not. Don't, don't yell now. Might ruin my, you know. Um, so we, we uh, announced hack programming language in March. That was pretty exciting. We're going to dive into what hack was a little bit later. Um, yeah, woot, woot, thank you. Um, woot indeed. And we also did a bunch of other excellent automation, right? Everyone see the XKCD cartoon on the right? We decided that we fall in the matrix where, you know, we should probably try to replace ourselves with shell scripts. So you'll notice our push process is now much faster. You'll notice we, our pull request process, we can actually review them within a day um, and land them right away. So there's been a lot of, you know, good procedural stuff going on. Um, and then more to come. Do, do, do. Um, Here's a, here's a fun picture of, uh, look at that. We, we have designers working on our slides. Isn't this beautiful? So here's a fun snapshot of our community. Uh, a few of the people have decided they don't want profile pictures on GitHub. So <laughs> that's what we get. Um, but for example, uh, Dan Slow in the bottom right-hand side, he wrote the entire OSX port. So we compile on OSX because of that guy. He was awesome. Or Simon Welsh on the, in the big picture in the middle. Uh, he did all of our H&I conversions. <laughs> he also figured out Hack about three months before Hack actually launched. He went through our source code and like back solved what all of the functions you could call were and all of the syntax requirements and wrote a complete framework in Hack before he even knew the language was called Hack. So this guy was pretty awesome. I'm pretty impressed with our community so far. Um, Anthony, the big guy in the top middle, he owns uh, Apache 2.2. So if you're running on Apache 2.2, he gets all of your bugs. Whew, not me. So that is a little snapshot of our community. Anyone in the crowd from the picture? Yeah, that square blocky guys in the back, right? No. 
Um, okay, so who runs our stuff? Don't take my word for it. Uh, there's a bunch of, you know, smallish companies launching uh, on HHVM. More to come soon that I can't yet tell you about, but there'll be some exciting announcements. Uh, the biggest one on the slide that you'll probably notice is Baidu. So the, the Chinese search engine one day sent us a message and is like, thanks for writing HHVM, we're running everything on it. We're like, what? <laughs> Wait, you didn't ask us? Number one, we have no idea you're in PHP. Number two, we had no idea you were working on this, but thank you. And then I replied back with a bunch of stuff, uh, thanking them and asking if they can publish some PR stuff. They replied back with, we don't speak very good English. <laughs> So this is our uh, PR slide about Baidu running on HHVM. Um, there's a bunch of other developers. You can find our community page. A bunch of people are shipping over. More to come. Also exciting, uh, we didn't launch anything in June, but still 30,000 people installed our package. So that's kind of exciting. Uh, hopefully somewhere in the audience. Are we going to install HHVM already? Hands up. Okay, all right. We got like 20 of the 30,000 came out today. It's nice of you guys. Okay, so that's the kind of a snapshot into our open source process, uh, and I'm going to hand back to Sarah to chat about what's inside of HHVM. So you hear me harp on about uh, HHVM's performance a lot because the performance is really cool. Um, I actually think the performance is secondary to our uh, other language features, which Paul's going to talk about, but performance is still important because performance means money. It means um, few having to run fewer servers. It also means that your users get a faster experience. You know, um, Google put out a, a study uh, some months ago saying that if somebody has to wait uh, 100 milliseconds on your site but 10 milliseconds on your competitor's site, they actually will go to your competitor's site because it's that subconsciously like experienceable. So performance is definitely important. How do we get that performance? Well. We get that performance first by starting off with something very close to what PHP has right now. We've got a really basic uh, parser that takes PHP source code, turns that into opcodes. And that technically is enough for a site to run. That's what PHP does. It turns it into opcodes and says, okay, my op is add. I'm going to translate that into some you know, instruction that takes two numbers, adds them together, gets the right type. But then we go past that. We say, okay, after we've run those bytecodes a few times, we notice, okay, these operands tend to come in as integers. Those come, tend to come in as strings. Those tend to come in as objects. We kind of have a good idea for what uh, actual execution flow looks like. Let's start building together some tracelets and compiling those tracelets to actual machine code. Because the machine code is going to run faster. It's like if you were to write a PHP interpreter in PHP, you kind of expect that that's going to be slower, right? Somebody actually did that. Um, Similarly, if you write any language in something that has to reinterpret it, that's going to be slower than if you write a language that just compiles straight to machine code. So we look at it, we say, all right, is this code hot? Great. Let's go ahead and compile that to machine code, run it directly on the processor, and we're going to go lots and lots faster. Um, the definition of lots and lots faster is really code dependent. Uh, if you are CPU bottlenecked right now, you're probably going to see more of a gain, maybe a 4 or 5x gain. If you're more I.O. bottlenecked, you're probably not going to see as much, maybe 50% gain or something like that. Uh, on average, I tend to see about a 2 to 2.5 two times gain on any given sort of default install of a framework. So we've got one other mode, and that's what we call repo authoritative mode. In repo authoritative mode, we take that initial step out of the runtime process. Instead of saying, hey, has this file changed? Okay, I'll recompile it. Hey, has this file changed? Oh, it hasn't? Okay, I'll use my cache. Okay, has this changed? Oh, it hasn't. I'll reuse my cache. Instead of obsessively checking if the file's changed over and over again, it just says, I'm going to assume the file hasn't changed, and I'm not even going to think about looking at my bytecode cache, because I've got this JIT cache over here, so I'm always going to go to my machine code. It skips a lot of steps on every single request that you know aren't going to change in production. You're not editing your files on your server live, I hope. Um, <laughs> Maybe you are editing your files on your server live, in which case repo mode's not for you. Um, but if, you're, if you are deploying to your, uh, to your servers, uh, like on a weekly basis or something like that, uh, repo mode makes sense because your files aren't updating, so you can get things running a lot quicker. APC has something similar to this. It's called no stat. Um, means don't look at the file. Uh, this is just sort of taking that to the nth degree. So that's sort of the high-level picture. A little bit lower down, we see a few more steps involved in this process. And the orange boxes you see in this graph here show what PHP's versions of these things are. So we take PHP source, compile it to bytecode, just like PHP does, using the Zend engine. From there, that bytecode gets turned into some kind of an optimized bytecode. You know, we take out uh, unnecessary operations, static things that always yield the same value, things like that. 
Opcache Plus does that as well. So PHP is doing the same thing that we're doing up to this point. The difference is PHP is now running that. What we do is we turn those into what we call intermediate representation. This is sort of an abstract execution tree. It says, all right, over the course of this whole function, I'm going to be going this way and this way, and eventually this value I've computed way up here is going to be used in that context way down there. So we can take out extra unnecessary things or combine operations or avoid performing the same operation multiple times. We take that, we optimize it again. Because, you know, if you can optimize once, why not optimize again? Finally, we take that down to virtual assembly, because we want to target multiple platforms, not just Intel 64-bit. And then from there, we take that and turn it into actual machine code. So the comp compilation of a single file definitely takes longer on HHVM. I'll say that right now. HHVM is slower compiling a file. But how many times during a server's lifetime are you compiling a file versus running it? It's running it that matters. So we get down to this machine code, and we run that really fast, because it's just native x86 code. And yay. But I can drone on and on about how the compiler works and just tell you it's really fast. Why not look at some actual graphs? Now, there are three kinds of lies, and one of them is statistics. So run your own benchmarks. But these are some benchmarks done by people not at Facebook. These are this particular guy is working on the HHVM project as an open source thing, but uh, I've got another set of graphs by somebody else. These are just folks who said, you know what? I use Magento. I care about running Magento fast. Let's see how it works on PHP 5.5 versus uh, HHVM. Well, it turns out a lot more, uh, sorry, this, on this graph, a lot shorter response time. So search test takes over 600 milliseconds on PHP 5.5 takes just under 200 milliseconds on HHVM. That's a huge difference. That's a third of a second. Your users will notice that. Uh, how about requests per second? How many servers are we going to need? Well, on uh, PHP 5.5, that same endpoint is going to give us, what, 10 requests per second. On HHVM, we're going to get almost 30. Again, a 3 to 1 difference. That's going to turn into actual money savings in terms of how many AC2 instances or whatever else you're going to actually need to run the site. Uh, Christian Stocker, nothing to do with the HHVM project, but he was kind of curious about it. Published his own numbers. Uh, these on Symphony. Again, we see the same thing. We see better requests per second on HHVM versus PHP 5.5 and shorter response times. So, good numbers. Uh, Paul's going to talk to you about the fun, cool toys that you can find in HHVM, particularly things like Hack. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Particularly things like hack? Exactly things like hack. So I'm going to tell you what the hack language is. Um, first of all, I want to know who has used hack before? Who has used the hack language? All right, three people. Good. So I am ready to teach you all, and when you walk out of here, we'll have 80 more users. OK, so hack is a, both a superset and a subset of PHP. So we took all of the disastrous things out of PHP. You can no longer use double dollar sign. You can no longer use uh, pass by reference uh, when you do the reference at the call site. Like there is insane things built into PHP, um, and uh, uh, probably about 40 things I think we have removed from the language that are just disallowed in Hack. Sorry, if you're doing them, please do it a better way. Um, <laughs> go to. <laughs> do we support go to? I don't know. I think we pulled out GoTo. Sorry, Sarah. Sarah's a big proponent of GoTo. <laughs> um, but so we removed a bunch of things from Hack, um, but we've also added a bunch of things. The most important feature that you probably will notice is type hints. So it is a, you've heard of statically typed languages, right? Like C, C++. You've heard of dynamically typed languages, like maybe like not typed languages, like PHP. Um, we are a gradually typed language, is what Hack is called. So instead of forcing you to always put in your types, you can start just like PHP, take some normal PHP code and just uh, slap HH instead of PHP at the top, and it'll uh, be part of hack. And then you gradually add types wherever you want. Um, so you can put them in at the top. You can do all of your leaf functions, uh, the ones that are only called once. You can annotate those if you want. Or you can annotate your core functions. So somebody calling your stirlen stuff, uh, make sure that the types are all correct. There's a couple of types in the language, bool, int, float, num, string, the standard normal everything. Uh, we have return types, properties are typed, um, and there's a bunch of other features that we can go through, uh, generics, but I'll focus on typing too. So that's kind of an overview of hack, uh, and we'll dive down a bit. So first of all, this is what it looks like. So in white is PHP, and in green is hack. 
So all you do is you write the word int everywhere. That's what hack is. <laughs> uh, gross simplification, but you know. Um, so basically, you can put in types everywhere you want to put in types. You don't have to put in types everywhere you don't. Uh, did we not put in some? I think we typed this whole thing, but that's cool. Um, and if you notice, at the bottom, we new up a foo and then add an integer to it, and then try to call add again with banana. Uh, calling add with banana is going to give us a type error, right? So instead of, you know, banana, add is typed as it has to take an int. And if we pass a string to the thing, it freaks out and complains a bunch. So let's take a look at it live. So if you go to hacklang.org, which is our main website, um, you will find in the top right hand side a text box and a text box where you can type stuff and once you type stuff it will give you errors so for example I have a alpha that returns an int and I have an f which returns a string and I'm trying to return alpha so it says invalid return type this is a string it is incompatible with an int cool eh? and if I change this to beta all the type errors go away Yay. Um, how this works is insane. So our type checker is written in OCaml um, by a couple of French guys on the team, of course. Um, and the uh, OCaml can cross-compile to JavaScript. So we have the type checker actually running in the browser right here and showing you what you can do here. So for example, if I have this string here, let's say I try to add an integer. Oh, it yells at me. This is a num because this is used in an arithmetic operation and it's incompatible with a string. Um, and look at this. You want to see one insane thing we removed from the language? Whoa. If you have the, the integer string one and you try to add it to a one, that's still not allowed. Right? I know. Crazy, isn't it? <laughs> it doesn't automatically coerce to the string one. <laughs> or if you also have a one foo, that would also coerce to the string one in PHP. So this is the reason we've removed some of these things from the language, trying to help you stop shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, you can go through and play a ton in this, in this top right-hand box and get a feel for the type checker. Uh, similarly, I have a SSH session here. Um, I made, I put the file. Ooh, that's at the bottom. You probably can't see that. Um, if I... Uh, open this file here. You'll see I copied the exact same thing. And then on the, uh, I'll move this up. Doo, doo, doo. There we go. Um, and uh, Yes, look at you. And then if I run HH client, um, it does the exact same thing that it complains about up top. Uh, we have Vim integration, so it can pop up a little window that you hit enter on and it jumps you to the lines and all sorts of cool stuff like that. Uh, or Emacs if you're one of those. Uh, or any other um, extension you want to hook this up to. So that's kind of hack. You run HH client and it tells you what your problems are. If you go and fix the problem, uh, you change alpha to beta. Um, and then run HH client again, it says no errors. It's also very, very blazingly fast. On our code base of, what, 10 million lines of code, uh, it runs in 0 0.01 milliseconds, uh, if you haven't touched any files. If you touch the whole thing, I think it's 0.7. It approaches about a second for a, a clean warm-up on our code base, but it's still blazingly fast. All right, that's the type checker. Now let's talk about some other cool features we've added to Hack. Uh, so what is the most common thing that people do in constructors? They take the parameter and shove it onto the class. That is pretty much what constructors are designed for, right? Um, no more. Constructors are back to their normal use. If you put a visibility in front of the parameter, it will automatically gain that visibility on your class um, with that type. So don't have to waste your lines of code and waste your boilerplate. Small little nice things that just make programmers' jobs a little bit easier. Aha, generics. So anyone know generics from Java? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but if you know generics from Java, you pretty much know generics and hack. They work the same way. They're covariant the same way. They're contravariant the same way. They, they follow the exact same patterns. Um, you can, for example, we have a foo of type T. Then all of the T's throughout the return types and the type hints, uh, when you instantiate foo, you can make it a foo of ints or a foo of floats, and it works the exact same way that you expect, um, uh, specializing based on type. So... It's awesome. I really like this. All of our code is starting to become templated and working. Yes, question in the back. Correct. Good question. It does use type erasure for now. Um, so the generics are completely erased at runtime. Similarly, all the types are erased at runtime. Uh, this is, this is a kind of an extension. While HHVM runs your code, the hack types are thrown away, and we use our own inference to figure out your types. It's only for the type checker. But coming soon, we're going to start using some of your types to speed up your code. Are we? Oh, great. Okay, I, uh, I'm a month old. 
So we already are using the types uh, at runtime, so you don't have to, uh, they don't get erased as well. But generic, similar thing, we're going to start using the types uh, at runtime. Because, I mean, it's important, right? If we know the thing's a float, we can uh, only store it in a, a double register, right? Um, instead of having to move it back and forth. Okay. What the language has always needed. A replacement for array. <laughs> I am so sorry, but <laughs> arrays have, ha we have to put them out to pasture a little bit. So uh, arrays, as you know, are the data structure in PHP. They are both an array, a hash table, a vector, a linked list. They are whatever you want them to be. That is what arrays are used for. But we have added a optimized types into the runtime, so you actually have a capital V vector and a capital S set. And there's actually frozen versions of these, so you can, you know, covariantly pass them around. Um, we, we have, you know, uh, there, there are now collections. And they are fabulous. They coerce well to arrays. There is two arrays and from arrays. You can go back and forth uh, very quickly in the runtime. But please use these. They will make your typing life a lot easier as you're coding. Um, collections are amazing. And another cool feature, uh, async await. So anyone use C sharp? C sharp? OK. Uh, less people than Java. Cool. Um, so C sharp has this kind of idea of uh, you know, stopping execution and letting other things run at the same time without being threaded. Right? So you can stop your uh, execution flow, have somebody else run down to their first async, or uh, their first await. Everyone runs to their first await. Then you do the batch fetches. Then you come back, and everyone gets to run to the next uh, await. We have that. Uh, it's actually really good. It, without this, Facebook.com would take like 10 minutes to render the home page. So all of our data fetching is done like this inside of us, and hopefully you can use it too. Um, we have a couple of extensions that we're going to be pushing out, but if you want, you can write your own extensions. Uh, to, to use this framework. Right now, all it is is a batching framework. But with an extension for MongoDB or for a memcache or whatever, you can start doing asynchronous I.O., which is the holy grail for being fast. Okay, we have one other tool, but wait! I have a bunch of PHP code. How do I get into this awesome new hack stuff? Uh, this is what we ran at Facebook and what we did. We have something called the Hackificator. Cool name, right? Um, so what it does is it analyzes your PHP code and tries to figure out the types. So in this case, we will notice that this function f returns either a new foo or it returns null. So the type it will add is question mark foo. Question mark foo is a nullable foo, so it could be a foo. Um, the at signs, ah, but what are those at signs, Paul? Uh, the hackificator works in kind of an interesting way. Good question. Um, they, uh, uh, it puts at signs in front of everything, which means don't enforce this type hint, but instead warn into the logs if it was wrong. So it goes through, annotates all of your code with at signs everywhere. You run that in production for a week, and then you hand the log files to the hackificator and say, here is all your false positives. And it goes through and erases all of the things that warned that were wrong, and then removes the at signs from the rest of the stuff. So you get to learn what your code, you know, um, if, you, uh, <laughs> if your code showed that it was returning a null, but somehow you snuck in some dynamic way of passing an integer to this thing, um, you're able to find out through the logs. So that's what Hackifier does. So what this did is it inferred I'm passing ints. If you look on the right-hand side, I'm only passing ints to f. So it figured out that uh, foo takes, or that f takes ints. Uh, similarly, it does an extra pass on the thing, because once we've inferred one level of... Uh, of type hints, you can start inferring the next level of type hints, and you just slowly build up. Uh, we ran this on the Facebook code base. It took 18 hours to run, um, and after 18 hours, we were at 98% hack. So it's a pretty good uh, uh, little piece of code. It takes a little while, but you should try running it on yours and see what type hints you get. Yes? Is it four passes? At Facebook, it was not four passes. Basically, it's an infinite number of passes until it reaches a steady state. So it just keeps going over and over and over until, you know, we're done. Um, and hopefully, uh, it, it doesn't erase type, so it's monotonically increasing. So you will reach a steady state at some point. Um, or the computer will stop. <laughs> so uh, that happened to us a few times, too. Um, so here is our graph of hack usage inside of Facebook. So at the beginning, in February, we started off uh, at like about 10%. So this 10% was done by the original hack team by hand. They converted a lot of core libraries, a lot of internal deep representations to hack, and started adding type hints and switching to vectors and collections and stuff. Um, so this is all done by hand. And you'll see the gradient start going up. So some people are coding a little bit in hack. Then we ran the first version of the Hackificator, and it bumped us up another 5%. Then more people are writing hack code, either new code, Greenfield, or converting existing code to hack. 
um, switching over. Then we got a new version of the Hackificator. It can figure out more stuff. Um, then we got to bump up. Then more people code in Hack. Ooh, the Hackificator got better this time. Um, and over and over and over. And right now we're about 98% hack code inside of our Facebook code base. Um, so that's pretty cool. We aren't going to get to 100%. So this is interesting. Um, getting to 100% is kind of hard. For example, hack does not support any code outside of less than question mark. Right? You can't put HTML code around your PHP. So uh, we have some files that are like that. Converting them over is not as fun. Similarly, you can't use globals, and you can't use uh, uh, undefined variables. So how do you write an entry point? Well, our entry point is a PHP file that calls a hack function. So we have to have one PHP file for now. We're figuring this out, whether you can have an entry point that doesn't use globals. But if you ever need to use dollar underscore get or dollar underscore request or something like that, you have to use a PHP file to hand that into the hack world. So we won't hit 100% quite yet, um, but that's, uh, that's kind of where we're looking at right now. Kind of stable for a while. OK, a couple more things in hack. Uh, we have user attributes. So uh, you know all the awesome uh, ways of, like, say, PHP unit. You know how they do the data uh, providers in a comment, right? And then you structurally parse the comment? No more. You now can put anything you want in front of a uh, function in angle brackets and then use that via reflection to figure out, you know, whatever you want. PHP unit already supports this for data providers. You can use user attributes for your data providers, and they will pull it out happily. Yay. Thanks, Sebastian. Um, Similarly, there's another awesome thing in PHP called XHP. So have you used uh, E4X in JavaScript? E4X? No? OK. We're on the back end crowd here. Um, so th what this is is it's a first class citizen for your, uh, your HTML literals, your, your output literals. So this is the normal way of writing PHP, right? You echo some, you know, you have some uh, HTML stuff. And then in the middle, you're going to use dollar underscore get, right? If you do this, you now have a cross-site scripting hole. Right? You aren't encoding any of the data that comes in, and you, uh, um, you know, it's bad. Um, but instead, what you do is you use XML literals here. So in this case, $form is a variable that has a form XML straight in it. Um, form knows how to render down to a string at the very end. So you build up your entire tree using um, you know, full XML literals, and then at the end, you just echo it. And it'll two-string itself out all the way to the browser. It'll encode all of the parameters in the correct way. It'll uh, take care of all of your XSS for you. Um, and it's a really nice framework to build stuff in. So you build components instead of building strings. So instead of a templating language, you write a bunch of components, and then you glue them all together to make your final page. This is how all of the Facebook backend is written in XHP. It's very, very nice. Um, this is how you build a component. So if I want to make a my site footer, uh, you extend some other XHP class. The difference between XHP and normal classes is they start with colons, right? Semantics. So this has a colon in it, and then you make a stringify function, and in the stringify function, you just return the string of the result that you want. Um, you can compose them. As you notice here, the, we're composing a div. So my footer uses a div. So div is defined somewhere else, and it defines how it stringifies, and all the way down. It's turtles all the way down. Um, and then you just use the footer at the bottom. Uh, if we want to add the blink tag, I just checked. It is not in the standard library, so sorry, guys. But if you want to add the blink tag to your site, you can just make a blink element. Um, and we have some helper classes, in this case, HTML element. If you extend that, all you do is you say what tag you are, and it will take care of the, the rest of it for you. Uh, oh, one other thing. It's kind of hard to read, but um, XHP is statically typed very strongly. It was kind of a, a predecessor to hack. It was kind of a brain, um, it was kind of a, you know, it helped us out. You can categorize things. So you can say, this element only has this category of children as it's, ch um, that it is allowed. Or you can say that, in this example, children have to be a PC data or something of category phrase. So you can say what is allowed inside of your elements. Um, and if it doesn't, if you're trying to put an element that's not allowed inside of that, it's a runtime error. Um, or now it's a hack error, even better. So that is XHP. You should all use it. There is a PHP extension, so if you really don't want to, if you don't want to take all my snake oil and jump into hack straight up, please use this in PHP too. Yes. Can you make intermix PHP and HH? No. HH uh, hack files must have one tag, and it must be the very first four characters of the file. So hack files are hack files. PHP is PHP files. If you want to cross call, absolutely. Uh, if you have a function defined in PHP. 
You can include that file from the hack file and call it all. Similarly, uh, you can include a hack file from your PHP and call it. Totally fine. They won't be typed at all. As soon as you dive off into PHP land, the type checker is like, whoa, you could do anything. And it lets you, like, you can call whatever function with whatever parameters doing whatever. The type checker gives up on you if you switch to PHP mode. Just for that one function. Um, for all your other functions, you're still OK. All right, do we have time for another live demo? 11.15, no, no time. OK, I will dive into, I will talk about this. You can play with it yourself. One awesome feature of HHVM is we have a debugger. So you can uh, you know, use it as a normal read eval log loop, like in Python. So you run the thing, and you can print out variables, and play with your functions, and call whatever, and try to get a handle on it. But you can also connect to your running sandbox and set breakpoints, and then step through all sorts of things, and print out variables, and set watch points, and do all sorts of what you expect in a debugger. So HPHPD is fabulous. Uh, my intern is also building xdebug support right now. So if you use a, uh, an editor that uses xdebug, this will uh, help you out, hopefully. But wait, there's more. So PHP is coming up on 20 years old. Does anyone realize that? 20 years? That's a long time for a language. And in that time, one of the best features of PHP is what? It's documentation. <laughs> PHP, no, I'm serious. PHP's documentation was what got me into language because it was really complete, right? And everything's documented except sort of for the syntax of the language itself. Um, the, the, the spec for PHP has always been the engine. If something works in PHP, then it is spec compliant. If it doesn't, then it's not. That's not really a good way to run a language. And we, and I'm speaking in my PHP hat at the moment, um, have been talking for a long time, we really need a spec for PHP. Well, we're going to have one. Um, Facebook has hired a guy who uh, worked on C spec, actually, to take a look at PHP and figure out all those edge cases that are undocumented, all of those weird ways that um, the PHP syntax actually works out according to the official PHP implementation, and put that into a written spec. And that's going to enable us to do a couple of things. One, it enables us to figure out if HHVM is spec compliant, now that we actually have one. And two, it's going to allow the PHP team to work on uh, PHP NG, if you've heard of that. It's the next generation of PHP. It's going to be PHP version 6 or 7. We haven't figured that one out yet. Um, to make sure that that remains PHP spec compliant so that everything's running cleanly. We have been working on this for several weeks now. We are going to officially give it to uh, the PHP group, uh, hopefully next week. We're just working on a few little tweaks. Um, and then that's going to sort of live as a public thing, a properly open source thing that um, everybody can contribute to and build on. Yes, Patrick? I'm not really sure where it's going to live. Like, I, personally, I would actually love to see it sit on php.net somewhere like as an addendum to the official manual. Um, I don't know. We're going to work that out. Um, we have been showing it to some folks, uh, some folks in the PHP group already, um, to just get some initial feedback. But uh, when we do the, the, the proper, like, here it is next week, um, there's probably going to be lots of discussions on the internals list about, OK, now what do we do with it? Um, so that's going to be an exciting week of discussion, I think. Uh, so that's the last thing I wanted to show you. Um, it is several, a few hundred pages long. Um, I've just got a few sort of examples here of, what, of what's in there. But uh, look for that soon. So that's it. Um, more questions, apart from Patrick, who kept interrupting the entire time? Uh, yeah, in, in the back. So um, is the end goal, goal to get rid of all PHP and be using hack? Was that you said? Uh, so, I mean, that kind of depends on individual application owners. Certainly at Facebook, we have a goal of getting rid of as much regular PHP as we can because we want to have everything well typed and um, make sure that engineer, an engineer in one building can refactor something without completely destroying an engineer's work in another building. Um, for your site, that may or may not be a goal for you. Um, I would certainly recommend it. Like, I think XHP and Hack are like game changers uh, in terms of making websites better. Uh, but everybody's going to have their own opinions. Where do you see the project being three years from now? Oh, that's a good question. Good question. 
Um, where do I see the project being three years from now? Honestly, I think more in terms of the whole community of, of PHP users. Um, three years from now, I would like to see HHVM and the PHP group sort of working more closely together to improve the language for everybody. Um, and I think we've started to head in that direction. Um, PHP has started work on, on PHP and G because they're like, hey, people actually are kind of caring about performance. We need to put some more focus on that. Um, I'd like to see us sort of play off of each other some more. Um, maybe PHP takes some of the features we've developed. Maybe PHP develops some new features that we take on. Um, we let the community sort of decide what is actually useful or not. Um, do I see any big goals three years from now? I'd like to see there be no HHVM. I'd like to see hmm. it be named PHP 8. <laughs> but that's me. I Personally, I like the competition, but all right. <laughs> The hmm. um, so the question is how, how, how much collaboration has there been with the PHP internals community? Um, so I, I will say this. We've done it wrong in a few places. Uh, HHVM has done it wrong in a few <laughs> places. Um, like when we were working on Hack, we did that very closed environment. Um, I personally would have liked to have seen us um, participate with the PHP uh, internals group more and say, hey, we're thinking of... Um, Extending the language, maybe in sort of creating a new language out of this, can we get some feedback? Um, we were kind of late in the game getting feedback on that. Uh, but we have been working with a lot of people, uh, particularly since the announcement of Hack. Uh, everybody's got an opinion now, so there's a lot of discussion going on. Um, for the most part, it's actually useful discussion, so that's good. Um, journals, yeah. <laughs> they haven't taken, uh, like, so uh, as we come up with features, we uh, we'll even write patches and say, hey, here, if you want this in PHP, here's the code to do it. Um, some of that stuff gets taken, some not. Um, it's really up to, uh, it, it's really up to PHP's process to decide if we want that in PHP or not. Um, I would like our collaboration to be better, is sort of the answer I would give you there. Is that it? Okay, thank you very much, everybody.